Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate you joining us here today. Uh, today we are reporting just one new case as well as six additional recoveries, which lowers our active cases in this province to 29. Just 18 active cases now in our far north and 11 in the rest of the province. There have been just 10 new cases this past week. That is the lowest number of new cases in any seven day period since COVID was first detected in our province back in March. This is good news as we move into phase three of the reopen Saskatchewan plan on Monday. Gyms will reopen, restaurants will reopen, a number of personal services will reopen. So I would encourage everyone who is feeling well and is not immunocompromised to think about going, going out to your local gym or your local restaurant next week and to continue to support those local businesses that are already open and already give back so very much to our community. This is how our economy will recover and this is how we will bring back our jobs. Of course, everyone needs to know, needs to continue to follow all of the good physical distancing practices that have allowed us to control the spread of COVID-19. But if you're able to do so, please go out and support a local business. Over the past few weeks together, we have proven that we can do both of these things at the same time. We can reduce the spread of COVID-19 and we can reopen our economy safely. In fact, even at the height of our restrictions, Saskatchewan has actually shut down less of our provincial economy than any other jurisdiction in Canada. Our job losses, while still very significant, were less than any other province in Canada. 87% of Saskatchewan workers were able to keep working throughout this pandemic. And now with more businesses reopening and even more people will now be able to return to work. Today, Statistics Canada released new figures for manufacturing exports. While Saskatchewan's manu manufacturing exports are down 8.2% this year, this is by far the smallest decline of anywhere in Canada. Quebec, for example, saw their manufacturing exports fall by 23%. Ontario is down 45%. The national average decline is 35%. Saskatchewan's agricultural manufacturing exports are actually up 20% year over year. This is positive. So while every provincial economy has taken a hit, and we are no exception, Saskatchewan has been able to keep more of our economy going and more people working than any other province while at the same time, we have been able to reduce the spread of the COVID-19 virus. And because we have been so successful in reducing the spread, I know there are many Saskatchewan people who would like us to reopen more quickly. I get those calls, I get those texts, I get those emails each and every day. So do all of our MLAs. I want you to know that we hear you. And I would like to reopen faster as well and not just businesses, but also recreational activities and important medical services in our communities. And I know that everything that has been temporarily closed, whether it's a business or a school uh, uh, or an emergency room or, or a playground, this takes something away from the quality of life that we have and cherish and value so greatly here in Saskatchewan. So we are working very hard, hard to reopen as much as we can, and we're doing so to reopen it as quickly as we can but we need to do so safely because the COVID-19 virus has not gone away. So next week, we can expect a number of announcements uh, with respect to several new, more reopening dates related to medical services, to schools, to beaches, to parks, and to playgrounds. We are committed to getting all of these things reopened as soon as possible, but as safely as possible as well. Today, we're also announcing the expansion of the Saskatchewan Temporary Wage Supplement Program to include a larger number of workers who are helping our most vulnerable residents and, and our families. The Temporary Wage Supplement is a $400 a month wage top up for up to four months that is already being provided to many lower paid employees in seniors care homes, in personal care homes, in community based groups group homes in licensed child care facilities, in emergency shelters, in transition shelters, in integrated health centers, as well as to home care workers providing care to seniors in their own residence. The benefit today is being expanded to include anyone, regardless of their income level, 
who is working at a licensed public or private long-term care facility, which are under public health orders ordering visitor restrictions. We understand the additional pressure that has been placed on these employees because of the risk to our seniors, our family members in these long-term care homes. And because of the restrictions that have prevented family members from visiting and, and providing support as they normally would otherwise. Through this time, these workers have provided tremendous physical and emotional support to our seniors. Most importantly, they have provided our family members, our parents and our grandparents, they have protected them from the very kind, the, from the kind of devastating outbreaks that we have seen in long-term care centres in other provinces. They've gone above and beyond, and so we are providing this top-up in recognition of the great work that they have done and continue to do. In addition, workers at assisted living facilities, which also are under public health orders, can now receive the wage supplement if they earn less than $24 per hour and less than $2,500 per month. Workers at private daycares and approved private service homes will also be eligible. So I want to close by saying thank you. Thank you to all of these essential workers for all of the work that you are doing and for keeping our family members safe. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Shahab for, to make a few comments. Thank you, Premier. So, um, as the Premier said, you know, we look well uh, poised to re-enter reopening Saskatchewan Phase 3 next Monday and look forward to several sectors reopening um, in, the, uh, in the following weeks to months. Um, but I think we, I just want to reinforce that we, it is going forward in a new normal. And this new normal will continue for the foreseeable future till there's a vaccine, so as long as June. So I think we need to just be comfortable that we are now engaging in more and more leisure activity and, and, and economic opportunities uh, going forward starting Monday. But we really do have to pay attention to the guidance that is being provided by those sectors, gyms, restaurants. I strongly encourage uh, pe uh, um, um, uh, people to take the time to read the guidelines themselves and understand wh what they are so that we don't create a challenge in terms of not complying. Um, uh, just like I said, when we were reopening phase two, you know, don't try 10 shirts on uh, or 10 cardigans and, and just and then not buy any. You know, try to pick a shirt you want and bring it home and wear it and don't return it. So we need to support businesses to succeed. And, and you know, retail, we have shown that you can engage in retail with no transmission. We have shown that over the last two weeks with sec uh, phase two reopening. Uh, and, but, you know, phase three is more complex. Uh, the guidelines are more complex. The way we um, are going to have to behave in gyms, restaurants, other sectors are more complex. And we need to make sure that we comply from our side as customers to make it easier for gyms to continue to operate safely. Because if you don't, and there's a signal of transmission, then that will unfairly jeopardize the whole sector. And we, we just need to work together to make that reopening phase a safe phase for all these sectors, restaurants, gyms, other sectors. And same is for personal care services. When you have to get closer to two meters, first thing is don't go to any personal care service if you're feeling unwell. Even if you have the slightest symptoms, which you may think is nothing, do not go, rebook your appointment, get yourself tested. Uh, secondly, when you do go, uh, if you have an option, wear a mask. If you're going to get services less closer than two meters, your provider may look very different because they may be wearing a mask and some eye protection. That is to keep them safe and to keep you safe. That's two-way protection uh, because they will be using proper uh, masks and eye protection. And I think if we just comply with these measures, as well as you know, uh, keeping two meters apart at all times, that will make sure that we can move forward uh, safely. And finally, um, you know, our gatherings, uh, in, uh, you know, meeting within our virtual bubble, which now may include three to five households, three to five friends. You know, it's really good to socialize outdoors when you can instead of indoors, and put a little thought to any social event you're having, some pre-planning so that we can all do that safely and especially protect those who may be more vulnerable. And don't partake in social events if you're feeling unwell and think of getting tested. I think uh, there's sometimes a bit of a pressure to go to that special event, even if it's small, uh, because it was a long time planning. 
But even if you have even the slightest symptoms, it's better to stay away and follow up and get tested because I think that will ensure that we can move forward with the confidence that we have engendered so far by keeping our case numbers low, but already engaging in a lot of recreational and business activity without case numbers going up. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Premier. We'll now take uh, questions from the phone line. Operator. We have Zach Vissera with the Star Phoenix. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Premier and Dr. Shahab. I have a question for you in regards to protests in the province. Some organizers of upcoming protests in Regina have said that the notice sent out yesterday may have sent the message, a message discouraging people from attending those protests. Um, are you advising that people in this province not go to such protests? And if so, how do you reconcile that with the right people have to civil demonstrations? I, I would just make a, a short comment and then I would uh, turn it over to Dr. Shahab if he has any comments um, with respect to um, comments around the protests that occurred here the other day. I made uh, the la two days ago when I was out here last. I will leave um, those um, to stand uh, for themselves. But I, I do have concerns about any large gathering regardless of the cause. Um, d d from a healthcare perspective, th this, this virus and how it spreads uh, does not recognize the cause of the lar large gathering, whether it be a, a, a very good cause or, or whether it not be. It, it will spread regardless of the cause of the event. And we have over the course of the last now two and a half months, uh, people in this province, families in this province that have foregone many large events uh, some of them at great personal sacrifice, I would say. I'm thinking of the memorial services for loved ones. I'm thinking of uh, the worship services. I'm thinking of uh, the weddings, other celebrations, family celebrations, uh, community celebrations that have been forgone. Um, people have made this sacrifice to prevent the spread of this virus. So I would just ask people in the decisions uh, that they make each and every day, The where they go, what they attend, uh, to use very, very good judgment, um, to respect the public health orders that are in place, to um, abide by the physical distance, distancing measures uh, that are in place, because quite frankly, from a healthcare perspective, uh, this virus does not distinguish uh, why you are in or at the event uh, that you were at, and it may not the decisions that you make can not only keep you safe, but most certainly can keep those around you safe, your your friends and family that you will see in the days, uh, the days after. Doctor, anything to add? Yeah, I would just add that, again, from my perspective, um, anything that can be done remotely or virtually is better than anything that has to be done in person. I think that uh, uh, basic um, uh, recommendation will remain as long as there's a pandemic in the world. And that is not going to end till we can enter phase five, which by my estimation currently will not happen before June 2021. So this is a marathon. And there will be, unfortunately, many events where uh, there's uh, a compelling reason to get together because that, as human beings, we always do. We get together when there's joy or sadness. And as the Premier mentioned, we have all had situations where only immediate family members went to a funeral and um, uh, other close fa friends and family stayed away. Um, so that's just my general message. And then when events are happening outdoors and if there's a compulsion to be part of that, then again, you know, there was some guidance issued yesterday that is pretty straightforward, that two meters is the absolute minimum, staying even further apart is, is critical. Um, yeah, you know, and not handing things back and forth and um, doing all the other things that are in, in that guidance around not chanting or singing and, and using, uh, you know, posters is important. If there is a compulsion to physically be at that place, you know, there's been many things, uh, prayer services, others that have happened virtually. And while some prayer services and other uh, opportunities will increase, uh, will be allowed from next week, Many other events will still not be allowed. Many large events, uh, sporting or uh, cultural events, will not be allowed. And I'm not in no, no way trying to make a parallel between protests of, against injustice and large events. All I'm trying to say is that those are the settings in which transmission can happen unnoticed. 
and by the time transmission, secondary transmission happens to ho household members who are at higher risk, uh, you know, sometimes it's too late to stop. And I think we all need to be very cautious and careful. And even if we do decide to go to such an event, I think you need to exceed the minimum guidance, not try to uh, push the envelope. And I think that will remain critical over the next uh, weeks to months. Follow-up, Zach? I do, yes. Um, police services in South Kenya, Regina, that we spoke to, say that they prefer to take an education-based approach to this and, and not disrupt these gatherings or even be heavy-handed with the issuing of fines. Some police we've spoken to actually say they personally plan to attend these rallies. Um, so how does this work, if at all, from an enforcement standpoint? And if these rallies are going to continue, can you maybe go through some of the things that people should be doing again, Dr. Shahab, to stay safe? So, and again, I'm not trying to uh, say anything that I do personally speaks to what you should do at a rally or whether you should go to a rally or not. But, you know, if you're out and about walking, two meters is the minimum. There's no harm staying four or five meters away. And if you meet a friend or neighbor and you want to talk, you know, two meters is the minimum. Standing four or five meters away is better. So that's just something that, you know, as you see people out and about, they can be, you know, several dozen people out in a green area. But having more separation is important, not clustering together. Not, of course, even if you feel uh, meet friends and relatives or you are emotional because you're at a certain event, uh, which could be a rally, which could be um, another allowed gathering, which will be allowed in the future for even up to 30 people, not feeling the compulsion to you know, uh, physically engage with one another in sadness or joy, and not passing things back and forth. So I think some of those things, and of course, singing, chanting, all those things have been seen to cause transmission very quickly within a group, uh, with resulting in hospitaliz hospitalization and deaths either within the group or in secondary household members who may be older. So I think those guide guidelines are there for, for a purpose. And if people do choose to participate, I think exceeding those guidelines and not trying to push the envelope is critical, because that's what we saw uh, you know, worked. The COVID-19 was flattened and it's at low transmission levels, not due to some high-tech technology. It is due to simple measures that all of us took by maintaining physical distancing, by attention to uh, cough etiquette, hand hygiene, uh, but not, not participating in a way that we're handing things back and forth. And I think those same principles we need to follow going forward. We'll take the next question from the phone line operator. We have Adam Hunter with CBC. Hi, I'm wondering uh, if we can get a clearer timeline on phase four timing. Um, a lot of sports and camps are looking to make plans. Uh, they don't have guidelines on which they can even plan right now. So uh, do we have a date on phase four timing and will there be guidelines sent out to some of these sports and camp organizations that are looking for some uh, parameters on which they can operate when they're allowed to? Uh, the timelines uh, will be released uh, very shortly, uh, they will not today, and I would just say that the work uh, with uh, many of these organizations uh, in uh, Phase 4.1 uh, is, is occurring right now, uh, has been occurring for some period of time with respect to the parameters of how they uh, will be able to operate and we'll, we'll make that uh, uh, available to them at, at the first opportunity. Um, Dr. Shahab, would you, if you had anything to add on on the, uh, the consultations that are going on with respect to phase 4.1. Yeah, so again, uh, phase 4.1 will include uh, child and youth day camps, outdoor pools and spray parks, and other recreational outdoor sports and activities. And again, the timelines will likely be firmed up next week, uh, along with some initial guidance, but then that guidance will be further developed over the next uh, coming one or two weeks. And then phase 4.2, that that is going to be later than that, uh, which includes possibly indoor pools, indoor rinks, libraries, museums, galleries, uh, possibly movie theaters with some specific considerations and casinos and bingo halls. That'll be at a later date. Um, and we have said in the past that we like to give, you know, two to three weeks, at least between phases, maybe up to four weeks. So that gives a ballpark uh, estimation of when f f phase 4.1 will happen, and then maybe another buffer of at least two to three weeks for some, if not all, Things under 4.2, but again, the detailed guidance will the detail det uh, the details will be provided over the next one or two weeks. And I also have to say that if you look at other European countries, obviously some 
countries have opened up more quickly than others based on their own epidemiology. But we are going really fast. And, um, and in, in North America, you know, because we really uh, don't always have a national approach, we have a provincial approach, uh, which is based on our own epidemiology and context, and that's fine. Uh, but even if, if you look, you know, to our neighbors, there's some variation. But I think we are certainly going in a systematic way. We're trying to be cautious, but not at all slow, and, uh, and trying to, um, you know, engage in everything we can in a systematic uh, way with clear guidance that all of us should be familiar with. And we think this is really important for us to continue to move forward while uh, keeping case numbers low. Follow up, Adam? Yeah, I'm wondering what uh, Dr. Shahab and uh, Premier Mo have to say about the guidance being given to um, all the Crown employees that may be heading back to work in phase three and four um, into office buildings. Uh, first to Dr. Shahab, what's, what's your guidance on uh, people working from home versus working in, in an office? Should they stay home if they can? Should their employers keep them home? Yeah, so again, you know, where you can work from home, that is a, 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 a better option. And so there's some sectors where obviously you can't work from home, and that, that's the all the essential industries that kept going. But even there, they, we have learned a lot from how they were able to continue in a safe manner. So you could have significantly large numbers of persons at a workplace, but the, the shifts were staggered so that lunch breaks and other breaks were staggered in a way that you had less crowding in the lunch areas. You had protocols where you had greater attention to hand hygiene before and after using the washroom, before and after eating. The way people are behaving, you know, keeping physically distant, not sharing snacks or other food items, the things we take for granted with our second household, which is our workplace, we were not, that, that certainly, you shouldn't really treat your workplace as your virtual household. You keep, need to keep that physical distance because if you don't, uh, COVID spreads to many households, and, and even though cautions applied in essential industries, we had small clusters, but because people are doing everything they had to, those cl clusters w w were kept small. So th the same principles we will we'll have to do as we re-enter workplaces and, you know, crown corporations, other industries that uh, some, if not uh, many employees may continue to work remotely where that's productive. Some may have to go back to work, but behave very differently in terms of not just how they work, which in many cases you can organize in a way that's safe, but how you behave during lunch breaks and how do you socialize in a safe way with your colleagues. And I think all of that needs special care and attention. I would just uh, add to that, Adam. Um, uh, whether you uh, are able to work from home, and, and many will uh, be able to do that uh, for the, the next while, some may do it for, for you know, on a permanent basis, or or uh, whether they are required to come back to the office uh, as a full-time or come back to the office uh, for a number of hours a day or possibly a day or two a week. Uh, you know, employers and employees will be able to uh, work through that. Dr. Shahab has mentioned that there, there needs to be a, a new normal that we operate under, whether it's in our retail business or whether it's in a, an office office setting. We're currently working through uh, what a... a, uh, a uh, a plan would look like for bringing back uh, many government employees that are are working from home, ensuring that uh, we are uh, bringing there will be bringing some back, um, but some will continue to work at home for for a period of time. But it's also important for us to remember as we uh, go through the next number of weeks that throughout uh, this pandemic, 87 percent of of the uh, people that are working in this province have continued to work throughout this this time and we have been able to control the spread of this virus. Now many of them, yes, have been uh, working from home, but many have been working uh, in a very, very different environment, a new normal, uh, if you will. Uh, there's been some other challenges that have uh, arisen uh, as we uh, go through the phases of reopening that 13, that other 13 percent of the uh, the jobs in in our communities, uh, challenges, for instance, uh, with respect to childcare, and I would just say again that uh, we continue to have about 50 percent of our of our childcare uh, spaces that we had allotted for uh, people that are going back to work are still available. We have about 1,100 uh, 1,100 uh, childcare places that are open, and and uh, people can utilize those uh, for uh, for a period of time if uh, if they're going back to work and need uh, some 
some uh, options or access uh, to childcare. So there are uh, there are options and supports in place as people families uh, do return to work. But we all must also remember that the uh, the vast majority of uh, of the jobs in this province have continued, um, albeit differently, uh, throughout uh, the entire. Uh, the entire uh, last two and a half months where we have been working our way through this pandemic. One, one thing I just want to say is that right now, because vi vi virus transmission is low, uh, we can be confident going back to work, uh, but there should be a confident optimism not, optimism, not complacency. And everything we need to do in the new normal, we need to bake that in into our almost subconscious memory so that if and when uh, we see a second wave or whatever in the fall. We have the protocols in place so that for mo in most situations, we will not have to go back into lockdown. Because we have made our the way we work at the workplace so ingrained that it is safe and maintains the physical distancing, maintains the hand hygiene, the cough etiquette, staying home if you're sick, working remotely where possible, that we that will allow us to continue operating if we get a cluster or local geographical increase or a second wave with m minimizing the disruptions uh, that we had to take place in March, April, because at that time we had not learned everything we know now. But I think summer is the opportunity to really ingrain that um, at a fundamental level in our work environments so that if and when we do see an increase in transmission, for the most part that should not result in uh, in, increased risk in the workplace because we're already operating in a very different way while being productive. I'll take your next question on the phone line. We have Mary Mandrick with the Leader Post. Good afternoon, Premier Dr. Shahab. Uh, many parents I'm communicating with still do not understand why playgrounds, sporting fields for at least informal activities can't be open in phase three if we're going to be opening churches, if we're going to be doing other things where there's going to be this exchange anyway. Uh, they feel for whatever reason that children are being sort of singled out and unfairly because right now they've been off longer than they actually would have been for summer holidays. So can you offer some level of explanation as to why we're not at least considering early opening of playgrounds? I, I would just quickly say that we, we've heard those same concerns, uh, Murray, and we're working very hard on uh, how we would be able to um, work with, with, with organizations uh, to ensure that we can open these facilities for our children uh, sooner rather than later as well. As we, and we'll have more to say on that next week, as well as uh, some more direction with respect to the school year and a number of other uh, facilities that we've been working very hard on with, uh, um, with individuals and organizations that have been raising these concerns with the government, raising the concerns also with Dr. Shahab's office. But you want to comment a little bit more specific to uh, playground equipment and yeah. children's activities? So I think uh, some of the worship places and other settings, they will have very clear guidelines and people who will be monitoring how people enter and say then so they'll be supervised. A lot of play structures, other settings, while they're safe because they're outdoors, it'll really have to be and that guidance will come in terms of um, an earlier reopening date um, uh, compared to phase four. Uh, but you know there'll have to be some uh, awareness uh, in parents in terms of how they need to supervise children and keep children home if they're unwell. Um, and accept some low level of uh, transmission risk in those outdoor environments, which are low risk as far as we can see, and especially currently with low COVID transmission. But there needs to be some oversight in terms of how children engage, in terms of reducing crowding and hand sanitization uh, before and after using structures, which really you can't expect municipalities to sanitize them in any meaningful way on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think that's where you know some thought will have to be given. Um, uh, for outdoor structures and other uh, uh, playground activities. It's, it's a good point, uh, Murray, uh, because reopening Saskatchewan is not just about reopening that 13% of our economy that uh, has, has been on, on pause over the course of the last two months. Reopening Saskatchewan also includes the, uh, uh, the extracurricular activities that we and our children uh, take part in. And I, I would just say uh, to the parents that have concerns around children activities, organized sports and things that we most certainly hear you and we're working uh, very hard to uh, come up with some parameters where we can safely uh, get our kids out and get back to um, a new normal, if you will, uh, in, our, in our communities, not just from an e economic perspective. Follow up, Murray? Yeah, I, I guess what I'm getting back from parents is they want a parent 
uh, their rebuttal is that, well, the, the weather is getting warmer. We're told that that uh, stops the spread of infection, that they can uh, properly monitor the number of kids on the playground effectively themselves, that they can do these things as parents themselves. They truly don't understand, I guess, the messaging when we're seeing so few cases, uh, two in the last three days, I believe, uh, of new cases uh, happening right now, why they can't be entrusted to allow their kids to have some activities that uh, uh, they need to have, obviously. So can you better explain why playgrounds in the, at this particular stage would be all that much of a risk compared to anything else? We're, we're, we're hoping they will uh, be, we will be able to come up with some safe parameters for uh, for our kids uh, to to partake in some of these activities. Um, the, 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 I, I would just go back to the, the, by far and away, the largest reason that our numbers are good is is because we have been so very careful as individuals and we have uh, taken the, the precautionary measures with respect to uh, the size of gatherings that we are attending, with respect to uh, what we are touching, our, our sanitary um, our, our sanitary practices. That is why uh, we are having success here in Saskatchewan is because of the choices that we are making as individuals and and we hear uh, the concerns of parents with respect to playground equipment for example we're hearing uh, the uh, we're, we're hearing the voices of parents that want some certainty with respect to uh, whether or not there's going to be a school uh, resuming here this fall so we're, we're working very hard on on what uh, safe parameters can be for uh, for playground equipment for organized sports we we want parents uh, to be parents we want that to happen uh, sooner th sooner than sooner than later doctor anything else on that? yeah and again uh, i don't want to preempt the guidelines but you know we could all understand that now three to five families getting together on a regular basis or three or five friends or or playmates now playing mostly outdoors cycling or playing something to, uh, together the soccer or, uh, or other sports that's one thing because it's always the f same four or five friends and if there was a rare event of transmission, you can quickly trace who, who those five or six were. But as we look at sports camps and other things, I think the same principles will have to apply that you do it in a way that you can quickly identify who were the group of your 10, 15 individuals who you interacted with as you re-entered training for sports or uh, re-entered sports activities. Because the risk does go up a bit, the risk is lower outdoors, but not zero. Um, but you still want to make it manageable and still reduce, uh, you know, uh, uncontrolled mixing at any age group where if you do get into a transmission situation, there's potentially many more people who you can't even trace. And I think that's some of the challenges that we need to look at as we move forward cautiously. But I agree that summer is a time to enjoy outdoor activities and we need to move uh, faster on some of these areas. Next question on the phone line. We have Kayleen Swatsky with Global. Yes, hi. Um, I'm going to go back to the parks and playgrounds for just a second. Um, I understand that the parameters are forthcoming for these, but what is your response to some that are saying that it's taken too long for the provincial government to consider and factor in children and their needs into the reopen plan? I, I would I would just uh, point to the success that we are, are having in this province. And if you look back just... Uh, uh, not that many weeks ago, we were experiencing some of the highest numbers that we'd had to date uh, in, in certain areas of the province and, and still really uh, managing our way through what uh, guidelines uh, with respect to a reopened Saskatchewan plan would look like. So we've been working uh, with uh, people that have raised just these, concern, just these types of concerns uh, with us on how uh, we can move forward, but move forward safely because the, the spread of the virus is still there. And we have been um, fortunate in this province, not by accident or luck. Uh, we have been fortunate in this province by uh, the guidance of our chief medical health officer, but, but just as importantly, the decisions that individuals have made. They, they speak to our collective uh, success and you don't have to look very far uh, outside of, of our provincial borders to see um, some of the challenges that this virus is, is presenting. Um, when you look across, across Canada, uh, the, the, the number of cases per million people is just under 2,500. We're, we're about 550 here in Saskatchewan. When you get to a much more alarming number, the number of fatalities per, per million people, the Canadian number is, is over 200, 201 fatalities per million people. We're at nine in this province. Far, far lower than the Canadian average. And so we may, 
uh, be viewed as, as moving a little slow on, on, a, on a few items, but we need to ensure that we are moving safely. We need to preserve uh, these type of very powerful stats. These are not stats, these are people. Um, and we are in a very positive, positive place here in Saskatchewan. We are doing everything that we can to open up, yes, playgrounds, open up the other sectors of our economy. We want to get people back to work. We want to get people uh, moving into a what is a new normal, and there's no better time to do that when the weather's beautiful outside and it's summertime. And we're working feverishly uh, to ensure that we can have these parameters in place so that families can enjoy this summer, so parents can get back to being parents, so kids can be, get back to being kids under whatever this new normal is. Um, and, and, and we will endeavour to uh, bring forward a number of, uh, of these parameters, uh, likely early next week. And I'd just like to add that if you look at our use of green spaces in Saskatchewan, within cities and municipalities and others, you know, I think Saskatchewan has been uh, blessed with lots of green uh, uh, spaces. And apart from the play structures itself, you know, we have always encouraged outdoor activities, even in March, April, as the weather improved. And we have seen in initially immediate households um, enjoying the outdoors, and now groups of three to five households, th three to five pl uh, pl playmates uh, 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 as children enjoying outdoor spaces, whether they're biking or uh, partaking in other activities, unstructured play that's very good for childhood development. So we have already seen that, uh, but I think the remaining concern was just around multi-touch services like play structures that we just need a bit more thought uh, but uh, I think we are at a time with very soon, you know, we can give some very high-level recommendations uh, around parental supervision, especially for uh, younger kids, uh, and that, that can move forward. Follow-up, Kayleen? Yeah, um, Premier, you've touched pretty heavily on the successes that Saskatchewan has seen and that you want to get the province back open. There's no better time to do that. But then why was it decided to further stagger the reopen plan um, into splitting phase four into phases one, or sorry, parts one and two, instead of having that phase roll out all at once? The guidance of our chief medical health officer on the risk of the uh, the various items that we have in uh, in in this particular phase, uh, as we uh, had had put forward the reopen Saskatchewan plan, we had always said that it is a, a guideline or a framework, and we will be refining it as we go along. And we have included a, a number of additional. Uh, activities and, and sectors of the economy that were not in the original plan as we go. So this is uh, uh, being split into two uh, on the advice of, uh, of our chief medical health officer and, and health officials. And we do want to move on, on those sectors of our opening our community and our economy as soon as possible. And we don't want to hold up some sectors because there's still maybe some uh, foreseen risk in, in some other sectors. Um, the, the success uh, that we've had in this province when it comes to um, hindering the spread of, uh, of COVID-19 is, is very real. And I, I just can't thank the people of this province enough. We are 78% we're below the Canadian average when it comes to uh, COVID-19 infections. More importantly, we're 95% below the, the fatality rate in Canada. These are our tremendous numbers. We, are, we still need to be aware that this virus is still here. Just today, just today in Quebec, we saw 91 deaths in Ontario. 45 deaths. We're very fortunate in Saskatchewan that we do not have a fatality today, uh, but this virus is not very far away um, and, and it, it can come back at any time and that's why um, we need to ensure that we are reopening uh, as soon as possible, but reopening as safely as possible. We'll take our next question on the phone line. We have Lisa Schick with CJME. Hi. Um, some people have been asking whether the worship guidelines for the next phase extend to services like funerals, because if uh, they can have 30 people in a church for a Sunday service, then why would there only be allowed uh, 15 people at a funeral just a few days later? So uh, we can get some specific information on that, but I would agree that you can have indoor or outdoor or special events now in a safe manner that complies with the capacity of that facility. But uh, thank you for that comment, and we can get some specific information out. And again, what we have learned from both, um, you know, uh, the retail sector, but now with uh, gathering sizes and the allowance for uh, worship services, is that depending on the size of the building, you can have things that, as long as people maintain that physical distance, as long as there's 
sanitation of multi-touch services. And as long as people can stay within groups, that if there was transmission event, you only have to reach out to 15 people who are within a certain group, and then there may be another group that's in another room or another part of a larger hall. I think those are the principles that have served us well in the past, and those are the principles that we need to continue to um, embody as we move forward to prevent large transmission events, which can quickly um, spin out of control, and that's what we need to avoid as we move forward. But we will get some specific uh, uh, guidance on that point. Thank you. Follow up, Lisa? Um, yes, Dr. Shahab earlier said that uh, we're moving fairly quickly in reopening compared to other jurisdictions. Um, there are those in the province who feel like we're not moving quickly enough that we've had such low cases and they're saying, you know, we never actually got to uh, the number of cases that had been, I guess, in the modeling that had been the worst case scenario. So they want to move quicker. I, I guess, uh, Premier Dr. Shahab, what would you say to that? I can speak. Go ahead. Okay. No, I, what I was trying to say is that if you look at many European countries, you know, they have national guidance that is very conservative and very cautious because they take into account of all contexts, large cities, rural areas. Um, in Canada, we obviously, each province is looking at what pace they want to follow based on their context. So based on that, we have been able to, uh, in my view, reopen fairly quickly based on our case numbers. And we have to remember that the reopen Saskatchewan plan was designed in March, April, when we were just actually, our case numbers were going up. So we had to conceptualize a plan while our case numbers were going up. There was a lot of uncertainty. We learned a lot over the rest of April and May about what really controls uh, the spread of COVID. And it was very reassuring to see that actually our own personal actions, all of us behaving in a certain way, actually controlled COVID. Um, again, not a high-tech solution, but uh, the goodwill of all of us behaving in a certain way to keep ourselves and each other safe. So that knowledge was then applied to refine the reopening plan guidances. And like I said um, uh, early, uh, earlier this week, it allowed us even to increase our outdoor gathering limit from 15 to 13 phase three, which really we had thought wouldn't happen till phase mm -hmm. four. But having said that, I think as we move forward fairly quickly and even uh, pull, uh, compress some of our dates, and again, I do want to clarify that initially we thought we would give four to six weeks among phases, but we have compressed that to at least two to three weeks with the confidence we've agended. But that confidence shouldn't turn into complacency, and I think that's really important. Um, we can't really become um, not as careful as we've been so far even as our case numbers are low. So that, that same thoughtfulness that we've shown to each other when we're out shopping must continue when we're using a gym or a restaurant, and we must follow the guidance that's there for everyone's benefit and not see that as a restriction that a business owner is placing on us and have a bit of a back and forth about why I can't pull two tables together and this and that, because that same thoughtfulness will ensure that we remain safe as we move forward. I would uh, just add to that, Lisa, there's really three points uh, to reopening Saskatchewan. The first is our economy, and I think it's important for us to identify and recognize that we didn't idle the economy down to zero. In fact, in Saskatchewan, uh, we idled the economy uh, to the very minimum. In fact, we led the nation in, in only uh, pulling back about 13% uh, of the uh, of the jobs uh, here in Saskatchewan, 87 percent of the people continued uh, to go to work throughout this pandemic, and we were able to control the spread of this virus. Our export number is out today, um, although uh, we're concerning um, with a reduction year over year of 8.2 percent in exports, and and that is what drives our economy here uh, in Saskatchewan. When you look at other provinces such as uh, Quebec down 23 percent, Ontario down 45 percent. Again, we. We led the nation in uh, in in our export uh, export numbers uh, here today. With respect to our community, uh, we've been working very hard on on reopening sectors of our community, and we're, we're talking today about um, children's activities, playgrounds, and and such. We've have been working with our faith communities of, of all faiths on on worship services. We'll have more to play, say on the on the playgrounds in the days ahead, as well as beaches and and ultimately. Um, providing some guys, providing uh, um, some direction with respect to uh, the next school year. Um, last but certainly not least is uh, with respect to uh, reopening our healthcare system here in the province. And 
The Saskatchewan Health Authority has been out on a few different occasions and is re-engaging actively uh, in our surgeries and it's important to remember that we did not go to zero uh, with the, the surgeries that were being performed here. In fact, we've already uh, have, uh, have started that reopening and are actively working on that. We will have more to say on, on the advancement of uh, reopening our healthcare sector uh, next week as well, but we are uh, up and over 40% of uh, surgeries are occurring here and continuing to increase uh, those uh, in, in the province. Um, so it's reopening multiple sectors of not just our economy but our, but our community. But it's also important for us to recognize that um, many of these sectors were not um, set back to zero but they were uh, some of the higher risk areas were, were pulled back and, and now with phase three um, occurring on Monday uh, we are essentially, uh, with respect to the jobs, uh, reopening the very the vast majority of the sectors that include that that 13% of the uh, of the workplace that uh, was not able to attend over the course of the last two months. Now, we need to increase our our economic activities so that all of those jobs uh, can come back. And I would just encourage people in the in the days and weeks ahead to. Uh, to, to go out in our community and, and enjoy a, a meal at, uh, at their locally owned uh, restaurant to enjoy and to purchase uh, some items at some of the locally owned uh, businesses that uh, for so many years have supported uh, your community and your kids, uh, your kids activities and, and really uh, been, uh, been there for us when we needed them and, and they need us now. So I would encourage everyone to go out and, and support their local businesses and their community in the days and weeks ahead. We'll take our next question on the phone line. We have Cole Davenport with CTV. Hi there, good afternoon. Uh, is the government considering students uh, returning to classrooms in September and what kind of direction is being given to school divisions, teachers, parents and otherwise about preparing to have those students back in classrooms? And uh, this is work that's uh, actively being undertaken. We'll have more to say on that uh, very early next week. Follow up Cole. All right, and uh, uh, specialized services for people with autism and developmental disabilities uh, have no day to reopen. Uh, how can you justify allowing hair salons, for example, to reopen, but not services for, for kids with, uh, with autism? We can get some further details. Yeah, we'd have to get a little bit of further detail on that. I know uh, um, from an education perspective, Gord Wyant, uh, Minister of Education, has been doing uh, some work. Uh, with respect um, um, to these individuals, and I just I don't have the answer in front of me with respect to the um, the healthcare services uh, that are being offered. But we uh, we can follow up and provide you with uh, some clarification on that, Cole. And we'll take our last question from the phone line. We have Alicia Bridges with CBC. Hi, um, I have a couple of bigger picture health questions. My first is just beyond what is happening at the University of Saskatchewan, um, what is the province doing to ensure access to a vaccine um, once there is a, a vaccine candidate? Uh, what work is being done to prepare for that and to make sure we have access when it does happen? Well, we've advocated, uh, I'll speak at a high level, doctor, if you want to add to it, but we've advocated uh, very aggressively with our federal government of, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, Vito Intervac in Saskatoon that is uh, doing some tremendous work in this area, not only on their only own vaccine uh, that they are developing, um, but also on partnerships and uh, that they have with other uh, world-leading vaccine uh, researchers around the world. And, and there are a number of vaccines that are being worked on around the world. And, and not only is Vito Intervac uh, being uh, very active in, in what we believe will successfully be the uh, approval of their vaccine, but they will have access to others as well. Um, what we uh, invested uh, in uh, many millions of dollars alongside uh, the federal government was not only in that vaccine research, but in a production facilities to ensure that uh, when uh, A, either Vito Intervac comes up with the approval of their own vaccine or B, um, someone else does whom they have a partnership with uh, that they would be able to access that vaccine, ultimately produce uh, it right here in Saskatchewan for the residents of this province as well as, as well as other Canadians. And I, I, would, I would take this opportunity to uh, publicly uh, thank uh, the, the federal government for their in excess of $40 million investment that we have added to uh, with many millions of dollars uh, from the provincial government, over $4 million uh, from the provincial government, uh, not only in the vaccine research, but in the ability to produce the vaccine uh, upon uh, having a, uh, an approval. So, uh, Doctor, anything to add to that? 
Yeah, I would just add that um, as part of pandemic preparedness, we are actively engaged with the federal government that if and when a vaccine is available, we would be able to deliver that in a systematic way. And we will build on our two areas of success. The first area of success was that in 2009, uh, when the pandemic started in April, we had a wave in, uh, second wave in summer, in July 2009, and then our third wave um, uh, in um, September 2009. We had the vaccine available in, by October, and we were, be, we were able to, uh, in a systematic way, deliver a vaccine to anyone who wanted one. It, it was, a, it was an, an optional vaccine, and half the population chose to get the vaccine, and we had one of the highest vaccination rates um, in Canada, if not the world. And it was done in a very systematic way, so we will build on that success. And secondly, we do give the flu vaccine to around more than a third of the population every year. And we, over the years, have expanded the number of uh, colleagues who can vaccinate, pharmacists, public health nurses, physicians. And we will build upon that capacity to deliver the flu vaccine, which we will, of course, deliver this year as well in October, uh, to be able to quickly deploy and administer uh, a COVID vaccine if and when it's available. I just add to that, Alicia, we, we've been very, uh, this government has been very uh, uh, bullish, if you will, on, on international engagement. And, and much of that discussion stems around uh, the need for us to have relationships with our international partners from an export perspective, as this is how we create wealth in Saskatchewan as we export uh, goods that we produce, manufacture, um, or harvest. Um, there is another another uh, important aspect to the international engagement that uh, that we do and, and will continue to do uh, post uh, this COVID pandemic. And I would point uh, to our most recent engagement in South Korea where, yes, uh, we were working with uh, uh, agri-food purchasers. Yes, we were working with uh, um, um, those that may be interested in, in other products uh, from Saskatchewan. Um, but we were also uh, signed, uh, witnessed a, uh, a signing of a memorandum of understanding between the University of Saskatchewan, more specifically Vito Intervac with the, the International Vaccine Institute on, on exactly this type of information sharing. Um, and this is a, a, an organization that is doing some work with respect to a, a COVID-19 um, a COVID-19 uh, vaccination vaccine program. Um, so the, the international engagement that we uh, undertake is, is not solely focused on the economy, but it's also focused on advancing uh, the, the knowledge-based institutes that we have at our two universities, Saskatchewan Polytechnic, as well as in the private sector. And, um, you know, I just, I just point to this as uh, um, being a, 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 an opportunity uh, that Saskatchewan is realizing, not just from that engagement uh, in South Korea, but by international engagement in general, is to have these partnerships uh, so that we can ultimately uh, not only prosper economically, but also prosper uh, when it comes to accessing things such as a COVID-19 vaccine. Do you have a follow-up, Alicia? Yes, please, and thank you for that. Um, my next question is in regards to treatment. I'm just wondering what type of uh, medications and treatments are being uh, tried, experimented with, or used for COVID-19 cases in Saskatchewan at the moment? So at risk of seeing other politicians in North America being uh, dragged over the coals with their comments on different treatments, I will turn that over to my uh, much more knowledgeable friend. So we can get details of specific trials, but um, uh, our clinical colleagues in ICU, uh, respirology, and uh, infectious diseases, they are participating in systematic application of approved treatments for use in, in Canada, but they are doing it as part of clinical trials because, again, what we know is prevention is key. Um, more than 80% of people have an illness that can be safely managed at home. Uh, people who require hospitalization need excellent supportive care that they are getting either in an acute care floor, uh, which, which, may increase, uh, which may include supplementary oxygen, or within an ICU setting where, you know, Dr. Susan Shaw may be on or Scott could add to that. But really, a lot, uh, the, the bulk of the effective clinical management, even within a hospital ICU setting, is excellent ICU care or acute care, which is for the most part supportive. That includes where required oxygen and ventilation and other sports like 
dialysis and other multi-organ supports. And that has shown um, its results in Saskatchewan that with uh, around 51 hospitalizations, 15 plus ICU admissions, you know, our mortality rate has been low uh, and certainly not on the higher end uh, compared to other parts of the world. Uh, so the clinical care is based on uh, excellent ICU care and acute care um, that for the most part is supportive, but the, the use of clinical treatments is done in a systematic way as part of clinical trials so that uh, clinicians can learn in real time about which additional treatments may or may not show benefit. And I'll maybe just pause to see if Scott or Susan are on to add further to that. <coughs> Susan's not on, Dr. Shahab, but I, I would just reiterate for Alicia that we can certainly follow up with the clinical teams on your behalf and give you an idea of what type of clinical trials they're participating in um, actively. But as Dr. Shahab has said, most of most of the work is being done around supporting patients uh, in higher levels of care. Uh, it's not directly always directly related to drug treatments, but more supportive care. Thank you. And that concludes our time for today. Uh, for those that are on the line, we are not planning on ha holding a press conference tomorrow. We will have uh, COVID-19 case updates as per usual tomorrow and through the weekend with our next regularly scheduled press conference on Monday, June the 8th. Thanks very much for joining us.